you might tell from my accent that I'm Robbie. <laughs> But that's about it, really. You know, I've been modeling that, that, it for so long. I know. Robert, you know There's hardly any difference in style anymore. Isn't it really? but, um, okay, well, before we begin, maybe... Which, which logical level is the difference? That's the that question. question. Yeah. But I always give people a warning. Never, ever model someone at the level of identity. Otherwise, you could become a bit strange. You can't hear me very well? No. You can't hear either of us very well. You can't hear either of us very well. We need to be turned up, apparently. We could, is that better? Yes, just speak a bit louder, or... Oh, we have to turn ourselves up. We turn ourselves up a bit. Maybe get some audio-visual help, if we could. We need to be a bit louder, apparently. So, how's that? Yes. And how is that? Yes. Oh, splendid. Because we, we need to take care of the environment, environment. do we not? <laughs> but um, when the environment doesn't support us, we need to then change our behavior. Indeed. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> splendid. But, mm, but we'll, we'll, the rest of it will be a bit more of a surprise as we develop the talk. Um, so, how many of you have actually heard of this model, the logical level? A little show of hands. How many have not heard of this model? Or, or have not been exposed to it? Hands higher. Okay, so... Well, there's not really much to say then, really, is there? Um, <laughs> no, no, but it's supposed to be a deeper, deeper, a deeper, deeper dive. Okay. How so. many of you are uh, already NLP practitioners? How many of you are NLP master practitioners? How many of you are NLP trainers? Yay. How many of you are NLP master trainers? Wow. Impressed. How many of you are ninja NLP trainers? <laughs> <laughs> this is identity. <laughs> yeah, this is this is the next level, you know, which is coming coming soon. Does any how many of you have have no anyone have little or no NLP training, so not practitioners? Great, great. The uncontaminated few. <laughs> <laughs> so um, part of our gig tonight will be to tell you that we are we do have something to sell, which is good, which is that. Robert and I are presenting in Santa Cruz at his NLP University with uh, Judith, Judith Lowe, were you there? Judith Hello. Lowe is here. And obviously Judith Delosia, and we also have Holbom, Tim, Tim, Tim and Chris, Chris Holbom, and Susie. Susie Smith. So this is in the summer, we'll tell you more a, a bit later, but just so you have a bit of a frame of it, that some of what we're going to be doing is around in, in the summer is master uh, uh, trainer and also master, master practitioner. practitioner. And then also we'll be in Greece, uh, Crete, in September doing trainer training. So a little bit of what we're covering today is going to be what we're going to be covering there. So this is also maybe a bit of a taster if you're interested in kind of working with us. Yes, us. young. <laughs> so let's begin. Should we begin? Yes. Okay. So the idea is that I am going to present the logical levels as I've done for about the past 20 years to you, um, and kind of also how I present it on the trainer training and master trainer training. Um, so, the, And then there's going to be a little bit of a discussion with Robert in terms of what I've done, and also <laughs> maybe a bit of a Q&A. Then we're going to move on to another one of Robert's models, which is a variation of this called Coach to Awakener. Anyone familiar with that model? Okay, so that's... And then there's another one, which is levels of learning and change, which is another kind of variation. So that's why it's a deeper dive. But we also use the word nesting, and that's something around spatial anchors. So hopefully you'll see me walking around a bit and Robert, and that's also a kind of clue of the kind of trainer or master trainer techniques that we'll also be teaching. So shall I begin? Now the first thing I've got to do, which I forgot to do, is take a little prop out of my bag. Um, so I will do that, and hopefully I will find the zip quite quickly, as it's probably should have been done before. But never mind, here we are. It's a ball. So how I like to present the logical levels, and fortunately I know Robert can throw, is... Here we go. Are you ready? So you've got a throw, which was a stimulus from the environment, and you saw a behaviour, which is a catch. Now, stimulus and response is something quite well-known in psychology, as we heard from Stephen Gilligan earlier, it's also very much a foundation of the tote model. Exactly. So that element of psychology, familiar with that? Stimulus and response? Show of hands? Yeah, so something comes from the outside, whatever. 
Now, how did I develop this skill at catching was that I consciously, <laughs> obviously I didn't spend enough of my youth doing this. Um, that's the other part of the toad. A deliberate capability by practicing catching with one hand and with another and so forth. So the idea that the level of capability is in some sense is a mental map. It's something you consciously do so that you can then deliver an unconscious behavior, right? Because if you're going to be good at something, a behavior which you're good at is likely to be unconscious. I always like to say that when someone eats food, they don't do it like this. And it goes stab, lift, open, chew. Do any of you do that? Do you go through a kind of conscious process? No. So unconscious means you're good at it. Capability usually takes a little bit of time to develop. Now, here is uh, also something about my own training style. I'm a failed actor. That's how I landed up in NLP. <laughs> so I'm going to try and do a few um, acting things. So I'd like you to imagine that I'm 12 years old, and if I catch this ball, our team will win the cup. Yay! 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 And at that very moment, I may well say, I believe that sports are a wonderful thing, and I really value them. Indeed, I am a sportsman. <laughs> now let's do that again. I'm 12 years old again, if I catch the ball. Oh, oh boo. They're not nice to me. <laughs> And at that very moment, I might say, I don't really believe sports are a particularly good thing. I don't really value them, and I'm not a sportsman. So the model is, at some level, that we're going to likely have certain experiences in our childhood where we're going to form certain beliefs and even identify, have an identity of who we are. I am this, I am not that. One more little addition to my little play. I'm 12 years old again. Okay. I am an intellectual. We do not do sports. <laughs> sports for those hairy, thuggy people. <laughs> so I've always been curious about identity. It's one of the things that the logical levels has always sort of stimulated me. Why do people believe they are a certain way? And I'm going to question you about beliefs about identity and identity coming very soon. If I forget, one of you asked the question. But certainly for me, I remember meeting a woman who said to me, I have three sisters. My oldest one was a clever one. The second one was a pretty one. The third one was in some senses the kind of outdoory one. So I'm the wild one. <laughs> and I was really kind of curious with this. Did, did she believe at some level that when she was born, there were sort of four roles to be taken in this family? And three were taken, and the only option for her was to be wild. Well, so it's very interesting that sometimes when somebody says, I am one thing, I am thereby not another. I am pretty, therefore I can't be clever. I am clever, therefore I can't be pretty, or something like that. So it's a very kind of interesting piece about identity. Um, now, the next bit I'm going to do, as you get a sort of sense of the model, is can I tell you a story? Yes. Thank God, that's <laughs> relief. Um, now, now you've done it. No. <laughs> a long time ago. Okay. So a long time ago, when I was um, a bit younger, I worked uh, at an American company called NCR. They invented the cash register, and the founders went on to form IBM and stuff. So a well-known American company. This is when I was about 24. And I landed up in Birmingham, which is uh, where they had their training center to learn presentation skills. How many of you have been on a presentation skills course? A show of hands. Yes, well, the idea of a presentation skills course, which I assume is still quite similar, is they video you doing a presentation. You're not very good, so you feel ashamed. And somehow, automatically, you suddenly become very good at presentations. Is this the idea behind it? Is that fair? Anyway, there was a strange gentleman on this course called Chris, kind of tall chap, very slim. And he came up to me and said, hello, my name's Chris, and um, I'm an engineer. Um, I've been an engineer for the past 20 years. I have two teenage girls, and I thought I'd try my hand at sales. So I'm here to learn to be a salesman in my new job. Great. So it's Chris's turn to go on stage and present. And he looks quite shy, and then suddenly he kind of goes on stage and says, and if you don't buy this computer today, you will pay a terrible price. 
Not just now, but forever. <laughs> and you think I was overacting? I wasn't. Um, so it was a bit of a shock to see this from Chris, to be honest. But um, anyway, I was kind of curious. What's Chris about? Anyway, six months later, um, I hear that Chris has become the top performing salesperson in the country. And I was kind of shocked to thought, how is this possible? So I worked in the same office, I went up to him, and I said, Chris, how is it possible that you are so good now at presenting and um, selling and so forth? And he said, it is because God has put me in NCR and God has blessed all of their products. <laughs> well, I was a little shocked by this surprise. I couldn't argue with him one way or another whether God had put him there. But one thing I was sure, that God had not blessed their products. <laughs> anyway. But I was still curious. I was young. I wanted to make money and learn about sales. But I couldn't model him. This belief about God putting him in NCR just didn't quite work for me. So I thought, I know, I'll challenge him at the level of beliefs and values. So I pointed out a bit of a contradiction. I said, you are selling very expensive computers to companies which may well have shareholders who are a group of pension funds, widows. You're kind of stealing from widows by selling them these very expensive computers. I was maybe a little left wing when I was younger. And um, he looked a bit perplexed about this. And then finally he said, if I have to choose between sending my kids to a private school or those big companies, I'm going to choose my kids. But what did kind of emerge, which was different from Chris, was that he had a sense of vision or purpose. He had a real drive. There was something about that belief that he somehow had that sense of purpose um, that was um, quite compelling. Anyway, bringing the story to a close, I went up to Chris one day, and I must have had some calibration skills, noticing his kind of state. He looked kind of looking down, eye accessing cues, which apparently I heard today was invented partially by Judith Delosio. He was looking down, I didn't know about that at the time, I hadn't worked it out yet. And he said, no, I'm sad. And I said, what's wrong, Chris? And he said, well, I've just had an order faxed through to me for a million pounds. Oh. And I said, well, that's very strange. It seems strange that you are somehow sad. Could you tell me a little bit about that? And he said, sure, because I know every time I sell a computer, I've got to make hundreds and hundreds of phone calls, send out thousands of letters. If I'm lucky, I'll get half a dozen meetings. Of those, most of them will buy IBM. So I know I have a real mountain to climb just to get one or two new sales. So that, for me, is the problem. Every time I do a deal, I know I have a mountain to climb. So now... Um, that's the end of my kind of little speech, but I would like to use that as a way of unpacking the logical levels and ask the question, including to you, Robert, what was it that made Chris so spectacularly successful and so quickly? Anybody? Anyone? Any Show of hand? We have a gentleman here, yes. Um. That he was just aligned at all of those levels, they all, they all just aligned up with each other. Okay, so he aligned all those levels, thank you. Anyone else? We have a lady here and a lady here. Go he ahead. Believed he, he believed he could. So he believed he could, he could. which yeah. is, an in, and that's also at the level of belief, so that's important. Yeah, great, thank you. He had a strong enough vision that motivated him. A strong enough vision, yeah, great. Jerry? He had a purpose more than for just himself. Mm. It sounds like he put in a lot of hard work, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's not very NLP, yeah. but you know, he put in the hours. It's a lot of hard work. So that's also a behavior, isn't it? As well as your point earlier about kind of a sense of purpose. Yeah. His family depended on him doing some sales. His children needed to eat. Yeah. Should be some, something related to his values. He was just, he was just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo. And absolutely. I mean, it, certainly at that time in the world, computers were certainly emerging as a new force. So right place, right time. 
And that, you know, that's certainly true. If he would have been trying to do that in the 1920s, he'd be in trouble. Yeah. He was flexible. Flexible. Okay, let's just call out some... Go ahead. Collect he what evolved you... and learned. He evolved and learned, and he learned so quickly. He was so... He developed those capabilities. Remember, he started as an engineer. So I will add something, but I think it's good to have Robert. It, it, what would you suggest is, is, is some of the difference that made the difference for Chris? For Chris, is, I mean, basically that he was congruent, mm -hmm. which was a little bit like this idea of, of aligning. You know, there was clearly a number of different levels there um, because uh, I think probably this, the highest one is when he said, you know, God put me here to send to sell these products. Great. So it was it was his 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 in a sense his no you'd say his purpose or could also be his belief in his purpose. So some sort of congruence there between those levels. So it, it's a nice story in a way because it begins to I mean for me it begins to think all of these things are kind of singing in their own way, kind of in unison. All... They can could kind of. So that was an interesting one. I'd never thought of that. When I told Robert this story, um, he, he mentioned also this, this thing which I'd never thought of, is that when Chris said, God put me in NCR, he meant also that it's often you might meet somebody who might say, who's you know, say very, very devout, I went and got a job and I prayed to God to please help me and please you know, give me whatever it is to succeed, but no. He believed that God had actually put him in there as some sort of divine purpose to sell computers. Um, so that's also, in some senses, kind of very powerful, that when someone has got a sense that they somehow deserve something. That's right. So that's a kind of an interesting one, too. I, I think, for me, what the, the, the sort of kind of difference that makes a difference in some level is that the sales process involves a lot of rejection. And that rejection, that continual rejection, people will tend to take at the level of